Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. Just to start us off with here, you know, we talk about sound and, and how important it is and, and it, how it influences our lives. So I wanted to ask you if there was an early memory of how sound moved you, if you had a story about that in your own early childhood. Yeah. Uh, I have stories that I actually do not remember, but they are like on the subconscious level because uh my parents got divorced when I was two years old and uh, we moved away from father family. But as my mom told, uh, they were all musical. They were singing, playing pianos. And for a long time, I could not understand where's my like intuition and feeling that I want to learn piano came from because like I, I connected the dots. Uh, but the other funny story that I uh, it's probably not the one that you usually hear, <laughs> but uh, it was uh, at school. Uh, we have an interesting man as a music teacher, uh, and it's actually funny that he was the teacher, music teacher of my mom as well, uh, though we studied in different schools. Uh, and he was, at that time, he was already like around 70 years old. Uh, but he was super passionate about the music and he was one of those brilliant musicians who like literally can listen to the song and play it right away without notes or anything kind of things. And he had like big choir and all that stuff. But he, the memory that was like interesting point of view for me is was on his music lessons. Uh, we, at that time, I don't know how now program is structured, but at that time we learned a lot about compositors, about their history and all that stuff. And I remember when he was quizzing us, like what we remember and so on and so forth. And when no one can answer, he would literally fall on his knees and scream, Oh God of music, forgive this kids, please. <laughs> it was so funny, but the more I grew, I see like this deep passion. Wow. That's a teacher. Yeah. That's someone you're going to remember. For sure. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I guess he needed to motivate you somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he literally enjoyed it. And even like past in at his 90, he was, was still running like choir and playing instruments. It's like literally music called his life for a long time. And Mm -hmm. it, I think it's music surrounded my life from different perspectives as well, because from childhood I was taking dance classes and you need to have like musicality to follow the rhyme, rhythm and all that stuff. So yeah, it's different sides of music. <laughs> I love it though. Yeah. So you had a very passionate teacher at an early age, which I think is a fantastic thing and would be good for yeah. any student <laughs> or anyone. I think that's a, that's a good thing to have. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's different ways of experiencing music, you know, besides, uh, listening to it, obviously playing it and, and performing to it as a dancer. I mean, they're all yeah. different facets of the same gem, yeah. right? <laughs> so yeah, it sounds really interesting. I'm, I'm glad that you had that experience <laughs> at a young age. That's, yeah, that's a good me thing. Too. Yeah. So, um, where did all of the work that you're doing now come from? Because I know that you're working, like you're doing like inner work, and uh, you have you you've been a dancer. Is that that what you what you've done? And then how did things progress to what you're doing well, now? Well, dancing was not connected to it at first, though. The more I learn and study psychology, the more I uh, interested about incorporating different somatic experiences to my work. Uh, but basically for me, it started from trying to understand my own self, my own reactions. And it started when I got my first kid and uh, I was scared of my reactions to his cry and, and like f felt this 
urge to stop it immediately and it scared me and i went learning deep psychology and i had lucky that the first courses that i took i took them from gordon newfield it's like one of the lead experts in parents parenting and he talks a lot about like how play and creativity is important and this helped me to see what kind of psychology and therapy are there and i went studying art therapy in, and i took like this comprehensive course on different kind of therapy that was in include including music therapy and movement therapy so yeah it's involved from there but the more i worked from parents i led the support groups for parents for two years and the more i worked with them the more i see the need to work on the mental states of the mom and self and working with their past traumas and in connection with themselves that it will involve and it will bring more clarity to the child parent relationship it, it basically would not be the question at all <laughs> Mm, yeah, it's it's interesting. So did that involve like um your psychology after the birth? Like it was that like were you depressed? Was there some kind of something else going on there? Um how did you actually end up uh dealing with it? Cuz uh, I mean, specifically because I know you went into the inner work in order yeah. to understand it, but how were you helped in that moment? Well, I, I would say that uh, psychology was always a passion, passion of mine and I always had this like back thought about getting a degree in psychology just for myself at that point, just for myself. And when I found myself in this situation that I literally cannot understand how to raise my kids, so I would not like react that way. Uh, but also my mind, not the example that I would like take and ask questions because uh, the way we were raised, it's far from what I saw myself raising kids. Uh, that's why I started searching for like outer sources of information. And uh, I was happy to found an online community that was all about parenting. And I felt like this is what will help me. And it started from just being in that community, seeing the importance of knowing this knowledge. And I was happy and lucky that my husband had opportunity to like give me a chance to go study psychology while I was like was literally one year old. Uh, and I was studying literally at night because <laughs> when my kid asleep, but I was so passionate that it that didn't bother me at all that <laughs> I stay late just for that. And it was like literally se several years and just the moment I started, like in a few months of that, I felt like, oh, I need to share this knowledge. And I think this helped me felt not alone seeing that other face the similar problems, similar things. Uh, because at that time I was not the kind of person who would seek like personal support, uh, therapy or something or coaching or something like that, uh, because of my own traumas, beliefs, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this being in that community helped me see that I'm not alone and like normalize the getting help, asking for help, searching for help. And it involved through the years. And the more I went through this journey, the more I saw the need to help others. Yeah, it's a, I think that a lot of us have a problem asking for help. <laughs> Uh, definitely. Yeah, that is. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that. I'm sure you probably know way more about that than I do psychologically. <laughs> but, but yeah, um, and especially women. So I understand that your community is specifically for women. Is there a particular reason for that? I just feel that, first of all, uh, we at this collectively as a human beings in, at this phase where women understand importance of building the community and getting in touch and not doing it all on their own. And I want to be part of this collective, like evolvement. <laughs> That's why for now, I, I, I still yeah. work with men if they come to me, but uh, my community is mm -hmm. more towards women. Okay. Yeah. That, I mean, I can see why that would be helpful for a lot of women, especially women with children, because often, you know, they're, they don't think of themselves yeah. first. 
So yeah, it's, uh, I think it's, it's probably very helpful for them. Yeah. So where does music therapy come into this? Because I know that you have also studied that aspect of the psychology. Yeah. So can you talk a little to that and, and maybe like what you learned and how you apply yeah. it? Yeah. Uh the first time I met music therapy, it was during the time when I studied art therapy in general. And I remember this particular, well, our study was basically structured the way that every technique that we learned, we practice on ourselves and on the accountability partner in the, within the groups. And then on the different people, like we have, well, everyone had like set of people who will practice with them uh, as clients. And so I was astonished by how we on under conscious level can through music feel different th things i remember a particular exercise that we were doing is was like pl playing just literally tapping uh, the melody of how we feel when our mother approaches us to us in a good way and then how we feel like doing music how we feel uh, when she like for example yelling at us or something like that and then we did the same with the father figure but i didn't saw or know my father since two years old and i was at first like how i should do this <laughs> like what like this conscious level and she was like just believe and trust the process and I was astonished, I really getting chills <laughs> now as I talk into it. I was astonished how it still sure. evolves. It's, I still could do the melody for the father for different perspective of our interaction communication. And it was like, wow, it really goes deep and it felt safe. The more important, it felt safe. And that's why I was like, okay, how I do can do more of it, what different approaches are there. And now I think the music therapy, I would say, just became as a part of my life. Yeah, yeah, I can see how it would be helpful, definitely. And so it gets you in touch with your emotional truth, I guess. Is that a, another way to yeah, put that? Yeah, well, basically, if we think for a moment, before we were born, while we're still in our mother's with the first thing how we interact with the outer world is through the sounds. We hear the sounds mm -hmm. and even the studies done that babies after birth recognize the melody if mother listen to it repeatedly. They literally recognize this melody after birth. So and we need to understand here the important thing that we interact with the world through the sounds before our cognitive part of the brain is developed. So music speaks directly to the limbic system whereas the all emotions arises where all emotion interaction going on so it's powerful tool that go under the conscience and like literally pass through it yeah yeah i mean it is super powerful definitely um yeah that's really fascinating so it kind of hits us on a visceral level before we even have a brain to yes. process it really i mean <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's really interesting. Yeah, because I, I, you know, I, and you probably heard about this too, like women playing classical music to their belly as they're pregnant, <laughs> right? <laughs> to s see if they can, you know, increase the cognitive capacity of their child before they're born, right? <laughs> like all of this. I don't know. Do you think any of that works? Like, does does music actually increase intelligence in, in children when they're still, like, in the womb? Well I think it partly does, but, and uh, while specifically, I, I cannot say that now it's strictly to the classic musical, because now even the popular musical music is pretty uh, structured and complica complex uh, and complicated. Like in, before it was not the similar, but now it's more or less similar. What I mean by that, I mean that uh, in music, uh, classical music, we hear the violin, we hear the trombone, we hear all the different sounds and music instruments, and every sound interact with us in a different way. Uh, but I cannot say that there is like strictly a rule that this music will help with this one, this music will help. It's literally personal preferences. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it depends on what you're listening to. And yeah, I, I mean, I suspect that, um, but like inheritance wise, your genes, you know, like maybe you are inclined and also depending on where you are, you're inclined towards a certain type of music. Yeah. And if you're 
parents are listening to that or a parent is listening to that, you hear that and you have more affinity for that particular type of music I yeah guess. <laughs> it's definitely true and especially for the, like uh the old cultural music because nowadays it's more or less similar uh, among the world but before like even before we can speak to each other as uh, like human beings we start with music dance and rituals all was involved in the sound and uh, it's really uh we have this tree that goes down our roots goes down to the different types of sounds yeah it's it's really interesting to to dive into this kind of thing i'm really finding it fascinating so you've used music therapy for your clients in some cases yes yeah. and how did that uh, work how, how did it work well for them <laughs> yeah first of all i want to elaborate that music therapy it's not only about the music itself it's about the sounds it's about sure playing it's about listening it's about moving under the sound it's all this spectrum mm -hmm. uh, but it helps a lot and the simplest thing that i advise every single of my clients is just like know what different type of music moves you in different direction for example if you have the mm, this preference for music that you when you set to help you release the emotion make a playlist for that make a playlist to boost your energy make a playlist to boost your confidence and it's much more powerful than they think because i I can say probably it's partly saved my mental state when we moved here from from Ukraine to US you say because sure uh, there was a lot of emotions and I knew that I need to release them but like it's not for many people to save to like cry or feel that way in front of others so what I did I literally put uh, it was for a first few weeks I would say I would put my son to bed and while he napping and my husband at work, I literally put a headphones with particular set of music that moved me and I would just literally release the emotion, cry or just listen to it. And I think it saved my mental state throughout the, this journey. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, that's a big change, yeah. right? So why did you end up moving from the Ukraine to Texas? First, it was just from my husband's work. They relocated and we always wanted okay. like to uh, live in different places, to know different cultures, to have different experiences. But we wasn't sure if we will stay for long or not. But with the current mm -hmm. situation, we are kind of stuck in here. So, yeah. <laughs> So mm. we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a tough yeah. situation. Yeah. So do you, you still have relatives back yeah, home? Yeah. And that... we, we had yeah. a chance to see them literally in a for, for this for years because the, first the COVID hit, then I was pregnant, then I was, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's hard. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. So um, getting back to sort of where sound fits in with all of this, I'm curious about something because I, I think you'll have a unique perspective on this. Um, is there a difference between listening to music and playing music in people's psychology? Yes, there there is. Uh, and I would say even between just listening and singing alone, also there is a difference. And basically it's different levels and different approaches. When, while you listen, it can like evolve some emotions uh, that you just feel that way or this way by this music. But uh, when you sing, for example, if there are some meaningful lyrics for you, uh, singing as well as like just journaling or reading what you wrote, uh, write down is a different level of cognition. Just hearing back what you say is a different level of emotions. But when you play, especially if it improvisation play, uh, it helps like literally song your own melody and uh, create your own emotion journey and how fascinated it is if you play on an instrument for a while for example every day for a week for example or something like that you will start noticing that you have your own melody that you will play over and over again and it could be that the melody changes while your emotion changes it can be that the just the speed of melody will change but 
basically you will have your own melody and it's interesting to see how it evolves through the time yeah, yeah. and yeah. gladly there is tons of music instruments that you don't need to learn several years how to play on it for example hand drums kalimbas just a small drum very quick but even if you don't have instruments you can clap you can clip <laughs> you can do whatever sounds it well that's the end of this episode Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time.